Good evening, everybody. Now, on Sunday, um, Reverend Leonard, who is now somewhere in the wilds of Scotland, although he doesn't know where he's going, um, asked if I would top and tail this evening. So when I was thinking about it, I thought, oh, perhaps I could do one of those, um, those wonderful kind of over-the-top introductions. <laughs> if you're a snooker fan like me, it's just like Rob Walker type. Yeah, the rap rising thing. And I thought, actually, no, you don't want to hear me. You've come to hear John, and we're so pleased to be here and listening to him. Can I just do the admin one that if you have a mobile phone, can you switch it off and put it on silent? But otherwise, John, we're really looking forward. me to say something about my son, which to me is the least interesting thing. <laughs> uh, so I've done my best, um, but I have left an awful lot of material, um, some wonderful pictures of myself doing all kinds of exciting things on the cutting room floor. <laughs> so you won't see those, and uh, it will all be much the better for that. So I'm going to uh, split this talk into five sections. We're going to start, as is traditional, with beginnings. Then I'm going to give some glimpses of parish life over the last 20 odd years. I'm going to talk a bit about some previous lectures and talks that I've given. I'm going to refer to one or two books that I've found helpful. And then, since we have beginnings, we're going to have endings as well. So we start with the beginnings of my education in the uh, mid-1950s. Here I am holding the school spelling cup. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting school. It was a private school and, and boys went there till the age of seven. But girls were there till the age of eleven. And uh, the, the spelling cup was given for the person who remained standing when the whole school was um, assembled and, and everybody was given the spelling and if they got it wrong they sat down. So I was the last child standing, so I got the cup. <laughs> and you can see I'm looking quite pleased with myself. That's not surprising really in light of um, this school report. General remarks. As will be seen from the subject reports, John is doing really brilliantly. While I'm pleased with his work, I do see definite signs of swelled head. <laughs> Extreme argumentativeness. <laughs> Sociability, not very good. <laughs> so nothing's really changed. Has it? He is oversure of himself and rather bossy. <laughs> and I'm afraid that before long some larger boy will become so impatient that he will give John a hearty punch. <laughs> those, those were the days when school told you something you needed to know. <laughs> and of course, as you can tell, my mind is not. <laughs> so, we move on from beginnings in the school system to beginnings at work. There on the left you can see um, my card saying that I'm a member of Pricewaterhouse and Company, as it then was, uh, when I started work there, uh, and that I had probably more hair than was good for me. <laughs> I can't complain of that any longer. And then, 
um, the beginning of our marriage, our wedding day in 1972. The day itself was not that auspicious. It was quite wet. And it was also in the middle of a rail strike, so some of the guests never turned up. <laughs> but it seems to have lasted reasonably well. <laughs> Um, so from then on, uh, a few things happened. I carried on working and we had our four children, three of whom are here this evening, which is very nice of them to have come. Um, I was involved at St. John the Baptist Prothorn, we both were, in various ways for 20 odd years. And in the mid-1990s, I kind of felt that God was calling me to something and it turned out that it might have been ordained ministry. So, um, from then on, then I did three years training once I got through the selection conference. And uh, these are, these are the, you can't see them terribly well, but you can see that quite a lot of the people I trained with. Mm -hmm. And um, I put the last verse of Psalm 16. You show me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy, in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the whole of Psalm 16 I found to be uh, helpful throughout the training course, which was something quite new to me and which was um, a brilliant experience. So I got through the training and I was ordained deacon in 2001 and then uh, get two ordinations as you probably know, ordained priest in 2002 and this bottom picture is a family group uh, after that second ordination and we're in the school hall at Gorsright Junior School after, after my first uh, Holy Communion service and um, celebration, quite a lot of celebrations as we go through this. And so that's all I'm going to say about beginnings and I'm going to move on to glimpses of uh, parish life. But they are glimpses, they're not attempting to cover all the ground. Uh, we're going to have some accompaniment which will make it better <laughs> uh, from the bells. Um, partly, they're glimpses because they, they're what I've got photographs of. Um, and not all the photographs are all that brilliant. But the first one uh, is in um, the parish centre at St Mary and St John's. I went to St Mary and St John's as a curate. And um, this was the first labyrinth. This was the beginning of all the lab labyrinths that had been done in the parish. It was done in that very small centre, but it showed it showed that the, um, the labyrinth concept worked and could be taken into schools, which it, which it has been since. On the left you can see um, the Christingle. Christingle at St Mary and St John's was rather different from the one here, which I'll be talking about later on. Um, but it was at a time when the uniform organisations turned up in force and there were sometimes 150 or more people in the hall there. And um, so they, it, it was quite fun, quite a good exercise in crowd control. <laughs> there on the right, um, we took on a missionary. And the missionary was called Patrick and he was an interesting missionary because he was Kenyan. He came from Kenya and he came over with CMS to work as a missionary in Cowley in Oxford. And so it was kind of like everybody's idea of a reverse uh, missionary. Patrick is still around. Patrick is um, an ordained priest now and he's uh, working in, um, he's priest in charge of um, Wingfield and Cranbourne, so not, not very far away. He spent time, some time previously at Woos Hill. Um, here is a nice collage of photographs of the PCC at St Mary and St John's as it was in 2005. Um, out of all these people, there are only three who are still active in the church. There's, there's Marjorie, you probably recognise yourself. <laughs> Dave Moore and Pat Weeks. Um, well, what it shows, I think, is, is something that was characteristic of St Mary and St John's, and still is. What, um, what a friendly and welcoming group of people they were. Um, I was asked a question this morning when I gave a preview of this talk, uh, what things had changed. And I said, well, changes at St Mary and St John's have seen a shrinking of the congregation, but no change to the general ethos 
of the fellowship there, which, which people who've never been before um, recognise as something really rather special. So shortly after that, I got a free transfer to St. James, then a separate parish, and uh, moved, moved here, uh, as they said, um, up the hill. <laughs> that wasn't a compliment. But... <laughs> And um, started doing more of the same, but in a different context. And, and here is one of the fledgling services. I think I'm holding an Easter egg, so it's probably an Easter service in church. Um, but soon after I arrived, oh, and one other thing that I, when I arrived here, I arrived just in time for half the parish to disappear on a pilgrimage to Santiago. <laughs> so I was very welcome to to take services for what was left of the congregation. <laughs> but very soon after that, the conservation work got underway. And here are some photos of the church, stripped ready for action before the floors were dug up and the plaster stripped off the wall and the roofs taken off. Um, and it's remarkable, having seen more detailed photographs of the conservation work, that it was all put back so well together again. And then in 2010, St. James's Day, um, it doesn't really show up terribly well, but one of the things that was done was that all the brickwork in the tower was repointed. And it was remarkable at the time how sharp the profile of the tower became, having been weathered uh, to an extent. And you can see you can see it a bit better. You can me and have a look at this lovely pinnacle <laughs> with, um, with lovely pointing. Um, uh, if you go up there today, you'll see that, again, it's, it's weathered, it doesn't need reconnoitering, but um, it's, it's no longer as crisp as it was. And it was about that time that Richard Warren uh, moved on as well. I recall the vacancy, and, and I thought I'd taken quite a lot of services because I was the only priest here. Then. So I had a look at the parish registers of services, and uh, you can see on there, uh, this is Easter 2011, and um, most lines have got my signature against them, so I was obviously um, working much harder for my living then uh, than I have been recently with so many um, other, other colleagues. And of course, in the last vacancy, we were, we were in the middle of COVID, so entirely different rules applied. So there are lots of services and lots of sermons, and as you know, I love preaching. So that was a great delight, and I don't think I've ever not enjoyed, in some sense, preaching a sermon. So we've got three more opportunities on Sunday to catch up on those. If you've missed them to date, um, then I, I hope that I will have a chance to prepare something between now and then. Here's the choir. Uh, Choir looking, uh, looking uh, quite well turned out for a, a trip to Oxford. They were singing then at the ordination service for Bryn Bayman, some of you will remember Bryn, um, who, um, who stayed here a little while but, but didn't do a great deal of work in the parish. But um, for this ordination, Sir James Choir was invited to go and sing the service which they did. And the back row, um, Richard had left, but he came back because he had really sponsored Grimm's coordination. Julie yeah. hadn't arrived, but she came too. Uh, and, and I was there for my continuity. <laughs> <laughs> Following the uh, same year, we had, we had confirmation. We had so many candidates that we had to do it at Wellington. Uh, you can see here Reverend Hugh Wakeling and uh, Bishop Andrew Proud, who took the confirmation service and the final selection of candidates in that year. And then Julie arrived properly. And uh, this is a terrible photograph because it's a photograph of a picture in, in a paper. But you can see, you can see. Um, most people are still fairly familiar to this still. <laughs> Soon after that, I had my celebration of 10 years of ordained ministry, which had kind of flown by. And um, 
One of the best things about it was this brilliant cake which Karen Remington kindly made. And you can see at the bottom, just about, that, that she even put a bike on it. <laughs> and all around the squares of the board are things that I might or might not have been doing in the way of, uh, of uh, groups and classes and things. There were some other photos taken at this time. Uh, another family group. And then the social committee with two hangers on, Ed and myself, <laughs> pretending that we contributed any of the hard work that had gone into it. Um, and then I had my photograph taken with Joe, uh, because Joe was really the only other, um, what I would call, recreational cyclist. <laughs> and uh, so it was nice to have a photograph with him as well. But around that time, we had uh, several evenings in February, organised mainly by Chris, um, uh, social events, uh, things like uh, Guilds and Sullivan Evenings, Rogers and Hammerstein, and then this one which was uh, the fabulous 50s. And um, on the right is a, is a newspaper page from the Wokingham Times, and it tells me that I was reading from a 1958 I Spy Annual. <laughs> I have no recollection of that. <laughs> from a charity shop or something, <laughs> but it's remarkable what you do when, when you have to make a fool of yourself rather than <laughs> time. So, so watch out for um, the visual aids of which the slip is a minute. <laughs> to keep everyone in order. Uh, the following year I was made an honorary canon. Um, I think probably not, not so much for the mess that I've made of the parish during the vacancy, but, but because, because of, I've, I've been the shop steward for the um, unpaid clergy in the Archdeacon. And I think I'd make such a nuisance of myself in a typical fashion. They thought, well, we'll give him a bit of probation and then he'll be quiet. <laughs> Here we are with Colin, uh, Chris and Colin, and then Sue's holding up this scarf, which caused her a great deal of grief as she tried to sew on these little badges. It caused me a great deal of grief subsequently, but I didn't know which side which badge was to go on. I said, uh, but you have to put up with these things. And um, in the bottom, just after, after, after the group of us had been made honorary canons, um, the first time in 400 years the Queen came to Christchurch, Oxford for the Royal Maundy service, um, which was quite fun, uh, more fun than it was spiritual, I would suggest, uh, and really, like many royal services, rather strange, but it was nice to have had an opportunity to, to, um, to go to that. And perhaps that was the highlight of my being an honorary canon. Here's Easter Day, family communion in 2013. And this is one of my favourite photographs. All the children came up to the front, and as I was consecrating the bread and the wine, they were all there. There were some words for them to say, but I've got no idea what they were doing. But it just seems so much nicer to have them all there. Um, I don't mind being reverent and doing things formally and properly, but, but this seemed to give communion a whole new dimension. Now, the same year, uh, Julie organised a trip to Wintershaw, um, and there is the group after quite a long day, quite an arduous day, really. It was really warm, um, but they stood still long enough to have their photograph taken at the end. Then Pentecost services, you'll remember them, variable, variable uh, weather. There's Julie, there's Mark Aaron, some of you will remember him well enough. And there again, Julie's got the children around the altar, uh, as, as in the previous photo. And here's a family uh, photograph of a picnic being enjoyed by all. <laughs> then... Julie retired and um, right at the beginning of the lockdown and so everything had to be done virtually. There, were, there was a collection and a presentation to be made and here you can see the representatives of the parish <laughs> walking down the rock road to very strictly socially distanced. <laughs> and similarly in, in, in presenting the gifts to David 
uh, and Julie. But there is this, what I think is a lovely photograph of Julie, and, and there were all of these cards that people had kindly um, given to hand over to her. So it, it, was, it was about as good as we can make it, and it was nice when she was able to come back the following year for tea party. And then Gemma's farewell. Um, this was one of the first services that we were able to have outside, and the weather was variable. But um, Gemma's, Gemma's countenance wasn't. In both of these, these photographs, there she's roaring with laughter. And there she's still grinning, even, even after being surrounded by the rest of her clergy colleagues. So most of the clergy that have been in the parish um, in these last few years have, have, um, have managed to find their way on, onto the sides. And of course, the day after Julie arrived in, in um, 2011, that was when the two parishes were joined together and, and um, it became the parish as we know it now, except that of course St. Eligius wasn't around at the time and was added a bit later on. <coughs> So as well as all those events, there were lots of um, weddings and baptisms and there, Jeremy and Amanda Alcock, they're not the first couple that I married who I think are here today, yes, we got through that, didn't we? <laughs> sometimes weddings are something to be got through, sometimes baptisms are something to be got through, but generally um, they're a great delight and this is, this is um, the last of our grandchildren to be um, baptized, that's amazing. And um, then I must have done something wrong because none, none of the later grandchildren have yet been baptized. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Um, there were a lot of courses going on and I've, I've listed some of them and um, some of those took place more than once. There were lots of alpha courses lots of Christianity Explored courses. But my favourite one of all is the one on the right, uh, which started off as Monday Morning with Jesus in 2009. And we met in the hall and we looked at all kinds of aspects of Jesus' life, uh, like the parables and miracles that I listed there. And then we broadened it out a bit. And then uh, over time, the location changed, the time changed, it became Monday afternoon instead of Monday morning, but it carried on right up until COVID struck. And um, just before COVID started, we, we launched into a series of uh, sessions on well-known hymns. So I always felt that, um, that although we sing hymns, we enjoy singing hymns, we don't necessarily focus on the words. And so the way in which the words, especially for example, Charles Wesley's hymns, they're all rooted in the Bible. So looking at the way in which there are those connections between familiar hymns and, um, and, and the Bible seemed to be a good thing to do. I have done quite a lot of lectures and or talks. There's no real difference. Um, and a lot of them have been based, not surprisingly, on the Bible. So here are some of them. All is revealed about the book of Revelation, probably the most difficult of the New Testament books. Um, so never one to shirk a challenge, I thought I'd have a go at that. The Song of Songs, probably one of the most difficult of the Old Testament books. Ditto. Uh, a series of four on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which, um, which I put on to video uh, last year during lockdown. Another four on the Holy Spirit. Uh, various talks about the book of Psalms and, and various Lent lectures on um, the biblical account of Holy Week. So those, those were some of them. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit more about these three uh, general areas. I've, as you probably will know, I've always had a particular interest in the Protestant Reformation. And... Um, I gave at least three talks which related to that in one way or another. When I first went to Ethiopia in 2009, I was very struck by everything that I saw, which was a complete eye-opener in so many different ways. And then, latterly, um, 
I've kind of taken up stained glass as an interest. So I'm just going to talk briefly about each of those areas using um, some of the slides from talks that I gave. So you may recognise them. The first of the Reformation talks was called 3,000 Years of Pilgrimage, and, and it went much broader than the Reformation. It set the scene, if you like, for the Reformation, what the church was like, the Catholic Church throughout Europe um, during the medieval period. And there on the left is St. James, patron saint of pilgrims, and um, that engraving comes from an 18th century prayer book. I tried when I could to bring things closer to home, and although we have no relics in our church, um, in Reading um, uh, we had the Abbey, and this is from the museum in Reading where they tried to reconstruct what the Abbey looked like. It, was, it, it had something like 275 relics before the Reformation in it, um, and lots of pilgrims went there. The church was huge, uh, but it was all destroyed. And, um, and when I did the talk, uh, this was pretty much all that was left. If you've been to Reading and the, and the ruins recently, they've all been stabilised and cleaned, and um, the experience of the ruins is much more impressive. But it's still difficult to imagine how huge the church and the surrounding um, abbey estate was. I was very surprised when I gave um, this lecture, the Book of Common Prayer in the State of England. It was one of the best attended lectures of all the lectures that we had, and I never quite understood why, because I didn't think that it would be a particularly catchy title, although it was celebrating the 350th birthday of the 1662 prayer book and the 60th anniversary of the Queen's accession. Um, because I'm not any good at computer graphics, I had to make up my own slides. And this is, this is a timeline, and it starts in 1549, which was when the first prayer book was produced, and goes right through to 1928 and, and beyond, when the prayer book revision was rejected by Parliament. Now, 1549 was an interesting prayer book. It was based on the Roman Catholic Mass, but in English. Um, and during that year, I, I did reenact uh, Holy Communion according to the Book of Common Prayer of 1549. And I was surprised again that 30 people on a Sunday afternoon wanted to come to see that. I found it quite interesting. Um, and I read from the Book of Homilies, which, um, which uh, are quite long. You know, the whole homi one, one homily, which were, was the official, if you couldn't preach, you had to use the Book of Homilies. Uh, and each homily would perhaps go on for 30 minutes. I didn't preach the, the whole one. <laughs> Another rather homespun slide uh, with the Book of Common Prayer in the middle and then the 39 Articles and the Acts of Uniformity and Supremacy. In 1559, that was the first full year of Queen Elizabeth the first train. And it's really when the Book of Common Prayer solidified. The 1559 prayer book is, is very, very similar to the 1662 one that, um, that we take as, as the, the kind of um, gold standard now. But here's another one of my favourite photographs. The Chronicles of Finchinstead from 1956. It was a pageant that was put on in the church grounds and in the grounds of what was then still the manor house. Um, and one of the scenes in it was what happened during the Commonwealth. And during the Commonwealth, the church was closed the keys were taken and the rector was sent away. Um, and here we have various um, people looking quite happy with their lot in life during the Commonwealth period. When I gave the lecture, um, this, the dialogue was spoken by uh, Richard Owen as the, the rector and Morris Driver as the Puritan sergeant who had come to take away the <laughs> They, they both did brilliantly and, and were very effective in their roles, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Chris on behalf of Morris. Where's Morris? Oh, Morris, sorry I didn't know you Do you remember doing that? Do you remember doing it well? 
Well, I thought we did it well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and then, then the final one, which had the subtitle uh, about the Reformation in England, political principle or just plain, plain peculiar. And the conclusion that I reached at the end was it was slightly political, quite principled, but by and large it was very peculiar. <laughs> in the sense of being very unlike the Reformation in other continental countries, and uh, maybe all the better for it. Uh, but it was a difficult time, and this, uh, this woodblock, um, from contemporaneous woodblock, shows the distinction between the medieval church and, at the top, um, with uh, images being pulled down and then burnt, uh, the papists being sent packing with their poultry, their monstrances and their thuribles and um, their robes and they all go on to the Romish ship sent away. That's contrasted with the Protestant church with King Henry VIII handing out the Bible in English, one of the great novelties and ironically when he decided that every church should have a Bible, it was only a few years previously when people were being martyred for translating the Bible into English. And then a Protestant church with not a, not a stone altar, but a wooden table with the communion on it. Uh, people gathered around the font for baptism, but most people are in the body of the church listening to one of these newfangled sermons in English. So, that just shows what a difference it was, and in no middle way refers to the fact that there was very little compromise between the two approaches. So I move then on to Ethiopia, which, um, which I think has probably had quite a significant effect on me, on my understanding of things, particularly on my understanding of things as they are in a completely different part of the world. Um, I'd never been to Africa before I went to Ethiopia in 2009 and I really wasn't prepared for um, the, the differences between what went on there as a matter of course and what I took to be normal as it is uh, for example in this country and other western countries that, that I visited. Uh, prosperity is one thing. Um, the fact that in this country people tend not to talk about their religion, whereas Christians in Ethiopia, who are um, in, in the majority, are talking about their Christian belief all the time. And signs are up saying this is a Christian school, and that kind of thing, which we, we probably need to, you know, we shirk it, I think. Uh, and then, although most of them um, would be completely underprivileged in terms of what we're used to, they were so happy. They were happy in their religion, they were happy in their life, whatever they got or whatever they had in their life. Um, and that's why the recent history of the country, and this terrible civil war in the northern Tigray region is, is so desperately sad because there is such potential within the whole country. Um, but its history, if you know at all, of the Ethiopia and Abyssinia um, has, has been riven with intertribal violence um, for many years. So I went in 2009 with the Bible Study, uh, that Bible Society, to Addis Ababa. Then in 2013 with Bishop Andrew to the Anglican churches in the province of Gambella. Gambella is right on the edge of Ethiopia, the southeastern, southwestern corner. Um, bordering South Sudan, and the reason there are Anglican churches at all is not missionary effort on behalf of the Anglican church, but because a lot of Anglican Christians fled across the border from South Sudan, bringing their Anglican religion with them. And there are something like 100 churches, many of which are in refugee camps. Um, and so again, it's, a, it's just a completely different world. And uh, even when the priests came from the churches into Gambella town, um, they might have a three-day journey just to get back to their, to their churches. So the first time 
the first time I went, we saw these uh, firewood carriers, uh, women, exclusively women, um, who collected bundles of firewood up in the mountains and walked down with them on their backs into Addis Ababa and sold them. And at that time, the going rate was um, 50p for a bundle of firewood, which would have taken them half a day to, to take down and then to walk right back up to the mountain. Um, uh, evil says, well, yes, but 50p buys you more than it does here, which is true, but, but even so, it's, it's a kind of pittance, isn't it? So when I came back, I thought I would preach about it, and I made myself up a bundle, not exactly a firewood, but a brushwood and stuff, uh, and I, I made it a bit heavier <laughs> than I anticipated, so I was glad I made myself a stick as well. Um, to uh, pump myself up with, and you can see uh, Reverend Richard's bemusement. <laughs> he didn't know what was coming, this was on the Palm Sunday, but I, I talked about the experience that I had. And uh, we had a meeting one morning uh, with the Bible Society, and we had to stop because a procession came along. And uh, this procession was quite, quite noisy. which is the priests carrying the sacred tablets back to their churches from, from, from the centre of the city where they had been, been blessed as part of the ceremony. This procession went on for about 45 minutes and during that time we couldn't continue with our meeting. It's far worse than having the bells ring. <laughs> uh, the next time I went was quite different. We were out in a rural area. We went to Two villages one day, this was the first of them, and we were in, we were in a building, and just outside the window, um, just like the bells, uh, we had children's choir. me most, as I've seen, it was, it was fun, but um, what impressed me most was the hospitality that they offered, these people who had nothing, whose collections in church uh, would often be a handful of grain. Um, but we arrived, we, we'd driven for a, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, but before we got into the, the 4x4 vehicle, as you do, I'm sure that we had all washed our feet, put on our socks and our shoes and boots, but when we arrived there, it was important that we should have our feet washed. That was the hospitable thing to do. Uh, and so we had our feet washed and then we put our socks and shoes on again. And uh, we were entertained with the church service and with the choir recital and um, everything they could offer us. Uh, and then we went to the second village and we went through the same procedure again. <laughs> It was nothing to do with them that we'd had our feet washed before we left the hotel and at the first village. That was what they did. And in the second village, uh, it, it was even more extreme because they had to walk something like a mile with the water. So it was, you know, there, there was so much for me to learn, really. Um, I'm not sure uh, how much of it I've been able to put into practice. Um, because uh, even on Monday Thursday, I'm not that keen on foot washing. <laughs> but, uh, and, and of course, it, it all reflects, um, here's an easy opening to fit the fiction of, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet on the first Monday Thursday. 
And then the final visit to see some of the historical sites and to take part in the Timcat celebrations for the baptism of Christ in Addis Ababa. I included some video clips in the sermon that I did um, and I thought I wouldn't repeat that because I know that all of you are um, vivid, uh, at, sorry, not quite well, maybe vivid, uh, avid <laughs> sermon watchers online. So I didn't think I'd repeat that. I just give some stills. Here is one of the things that's done at Timcat is for holy water to be blessed. A very elaborate ceremony in um, what looks like a swimming pool. And then the water is pumped out and is sprayed onto the crowds. And you'd have thought, well, nobody's want to, get, want to get wet. But they do, because it's holy water. And it means something. And, um, and people come up and they ask for the, for, to actually have the, the pressurised hose sprayed on them so that they get absolutely soaking. Because that makes them feel that you know, they've got more than their fair share of the holiness that's around. And just to give you some idea of, um, here we've got music, we've got trumpets, we've got uh, just one choir, loads and loads of choirs all come to this central area. Uh, here's a, a, the heads of the crowds. And here are the people who come for the nine hour service, uh, starting at quarter to nine at night and going throughout the night to six o'clock. Um, you will be pleased to hear that the group from, from uh, the UK arrived about ten past six. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even then there was quite a lot of hanging around to do. Um, so Ethiopia, as I hope you can tell, is really, really a significant experience. Um, but I think the likelihood is that I won't ever go back to that. It's not a safe country to go to. And then stained glass. Well, some of you may remember that um, we had a vandal attack in St. James and um, a lot of windows were damaged. You, it's, this is not very good because you can't see it, but there is a crack right across uh, Jesus, the Good Shepherd's face, and another crack that goes down here. So the whole of this uh, piece of glass had to be replaced. So this is the replacement. Uh, and when I saw that had been done, um, it amazed me that anybody could paint so accurately to give such, such um, a, a good uh, replacement. Uh, and I thought that someone must know something about the windows in the church, and I discovered that no one did. There was nothing in the archives, no one knew who put them in and when. Um, and um, so I decided that I'd do a little research. And um, I did that on both the Victoria windows and on the two windows by Christopher Webb. This is, this is um, my favourite one of those two up here, the back of the church. And it's a, the ascension scene, but instead of the disciples looking up at the uh, Christ going into heaven, uh, we've got these um, people in Second World War dress, because the window was put in in 1945. And um, my theory, and I've done a lot of work on Christopher Webb, I've researched him, I've done an exhibition on him, a lecture, and I've written an article for the Journal of Stained Glass, that it seems to me that what he was trying to do was, was to bring quite deep theology home to people by, by making it, the ascension relate to ordinary people going about their ordinary work. And in many other windows, he does exactly the same thing. So I got quite fascinated um, by, by all of that. And so I did um, a lecture last year online, excited by stained glass, which you may or uh, you may not remember. Um, and um, these are two, two windows that were included, they're not in full. This is in Boxgrove Priory, and it's the Holy Dove coming down. Um, and it's in the West Wall, and the day that I went there, it was a beautiful sunny day, and light was streaming in, and was making a pool of light on the floor of the nave. And this is light coming through a window again in Bayer Cathedral in Normandy, and it's hitting a wall painting, an ancient wall painting of the crucifixion. You might just be able to make out with the cross there, uh, and, and uh, Mary, and John and Mary by the side of it. Uh, it's just, just, just to give you an idea that stained glass is not just looking at the windows, but looking at the effect of the light coming through the windows. So that's kind of a reprise of some, some lectures, and I'm going to move on to one or two books. Uh, if I didn't put the Bible on the list, 
um, you would be terribly cross, wouldn't you? <laughs> so I put the Bible on the list. Of course, the Bible is a really uh, precious book. Uh, and I think uh, those of you who know will know that um, that the Bible above everything is, is where the kind of heart um, of you know, what preaching and what living ought to be all about is. So I've coupled it with the Book of Common Prayer. Thinking about this, if I had to go to a desert island and I was allowed to take a, a book not including the Bible or Shakespeare, I think I would take the Book of Common Prayer. Not for the reason that most people do with the, with the beauty of language and all that kind of thing, though there is that and it's familiar to me from um, the way that I, was, I, was, uh, I grew up uh, in church with the Book of Common Prayer, that's in the name, so I'm doing two main services of the day. Um, but more importantly for me, um, there is so much in the Book of Common Prayer that, no, that now I know a bit about the Reformation. I can see why the words that Cranmer used are set there for a purpose. It's a, very, it's a kind of polemical book still, <coughs> setting out why certain doctrines are right and Protestant, and certain doctrines are wrong and Roman Catholic. And also, I only know about 10% of the book of Common Prayer, so it would be 90% of the book for me to study, which would be a great exercise to do on the desert island. The next book is a biography of Thomas Cranmer. It's um, 25 years old now. It's by David McCulloch, and it's um, it's it's a wonderful biography, but it's not for the faint-hearted. It's probably five or six hundred pages long and quite dense, but but it really explains about um, the motivation of Cranmer and how it was that he survived when so many others have. Henry VIII, not only his wives, but his ministers um, were executed or expelled. Um, Cranmer survived until the reign of Queen Mary, when, as you know, he was, he was executed. Um, but it's an important book for me because when I was going through the selection process, um, we were asked questions about things and we were asked questions about books. And I happened to have read this just before I went on the conference. And I was able to talk about it because it had made such an impression on me. And I was also able to um, draw parallels between what happened at the court of Henry VIII and what happened in the large industrial corporation that I was working in at the time, where the chairman had some of the characteristics of Henry VIII. <laughs> things. It was draft after draft of public announcements, just as there were for the Acts of Supremacy in Henry VIII's time. All these things. So, so in certain respect, many things don't change. Quite different, and they didn't even exist in 2001, are these four novels by Marilyn Robinson. And it's difficult to make me to explain precisely why it is that I find these so affecting. The subject matter is apparently really uninteresting. It's about a kind of dead-end town in Midwestern United States in the 1950s. Two families, one of a Presbyterian pastor and one of a Calvinist pastor. But Marilyn Robinson writes in such an affecting way about these somewhat strange but by ordinary characters in such a loving way. Even, even this character, Jack, who's the black sheep of one of the families, who spends his life kind of on the edge of criminality and uh, just can't do anything right and seems to intentionally do the wrong thing, is portrayed in such a way that it's impossible not to feel sympathy for him. Uh, at the heart of it, too, is there, is, there is a most beautiful love story. And um, so I really enjoyed these, and I very rarely read novels again, but I've read Gilead, the first novel, at least three, possibly four times. And um, 
I don't exactly recommend them because I made that mistake in the past and people have said, well, I don't see what you see in that. <laughs> Which is fair enough. But for me, I would have liked to have read you an extract from them, but, but really without the context, it doesn't mean anything. Marion Robertson's writing, I can best describe, uh, for me, as luminous in a way I think probably only Ian Forster approaches the, the same degree of, of clarity and beauty in the writing, in my opinion. <coughs> and then finally, and you'll be pleased to hear that there is some substance in this talk, we reach the Pilgrim's Progress, which you might have guessed if you looked at the handouts. <laughs> um, so, I've always wanted to do a talk on Pilgrim's Progress, but it's never quite seemed to fit in with anything else. So, I'm just doing a mini selection from the Pilgrim's Progress. I've got two excellent readers in Bev and Robert, who are going to help me out with this. I'm not going to go through it page by page. Uh, I'm not going to do more than kind of touch on some elements of it and try and whet your appetite. Uh, many people have a copy of the Pilgrim's Progress at home, but they never open it. Uh, possibly like a Bible. Uh, and in fact, Pilgrim's Progress is the second best-selling book uh, ever. Um, I suspect that's before, if you love all the Harry Potter books. <laughs> For 300 plus years, that has been the case. Written by John Bunyan in 1670s, Bunyan was a non-conformist preacher, and he refused to give the undertakings that were necessary under the law because only Anglican clergy could preach in those years after the Commonwealth. He refused to give the undertaking, so he was in prison till he did. He was in prison for 12 years, and during that time he wrote part one of the Pilgrim's Progress. Um, he never changed his mind, but he was released after 12 years, although he was put back in prison again for a couple of years later on. Pilgrim's Progress part one is all about Christian. Christian fleeing from the city of destruction and heading towards the celestial city, and it's, it's set as a form of dream. Later on, um, Bunyan decided that he would write part two, which is about Christian's life, Christiana, and their children, who had refused to go with Christian on the first journey, and who later make their own way on the same journey. The two, the two books are, are, are similar, but the feel is quite different, particularly because Though Christian has to shift to himself much of the time, though he has companions, uh, Christiana is a mere woman with, uh, with children who, who seem to, to go from very young, married and having children of their own in the course of part two, um, has to be protected by, by people with names like Mr. Braveheart and uh, Mr. Valiant for Truth and Mr. Standfast. Uh, and so there is, there is, there is more, there is more moralising and talk in part two than there is in part one. But I'm going to give you a chance to have a look at one of the, the characteristic elements of Pilgrim's Progress, both parts. Um, here we have a selection of the names of the characters. Those in green are generally good. And those in red are generally bad. <coughs> so in red we've got worldly wise man, timorous, pliable, ignorant, mistrust, flatterer, light mind, inconsiderate, bat size, and <laughs> he's blind. Uh, but we have some good people. We have piety and charity, penitent, faithful, sagacity, and, and so on. Let's, um, let's make a start on the handout, the big handout. Uh, in the middle you have this map. It starts here at the bottom with the City of Destruction. It goes up the first column, up the second column, up the third column, until you reach the Heavenly City. And you might find that uh, helpful as an aid memoir. Or it'll, at least, if you look at it afterwards, you'll see all the numerous places and incidents 
that I don't have time to mention. Christian's been reading a book, and the book has warned him of the wrath to come. And so he decides that he has to leave his home, leave the city of destruction. But he's hampered because he's got this great burden on his back. And I've got two illustrations of that. This one on the left is by William Blake. It shows him in his rags and completely bent over with the burden. Um, this is a Victorian one, so it's a bit more respectable. Still got a burden. Uh, and there he is running away from his uh, wife and children. And there are his neighbours just about to go and try and intercept him and persuade him not to be so stupid. One of these is called Pliable. Pliable is a red name. And um, he's convinced by what Christian says to him that he should go along with Christian until they get to the slough of despond. Great Mari slough into which they both fall. And Pliable gets really cross with Christian. He, he says, uh, you, you told me it was going to be wonderful. If it's this bad this early, how's it going to be like, what's it going to be like later on? And he drags himself out of the slough and he goes back to the city of destruction. Meanwhile, a Christian is determined to get to the other side, but his burden prevents him even when he reaches the bank getting up. Fortunately, a green coloured man comes to help him. His name is Help, and he's very helpful. <laughs> and he pulls him out of the mire. So, uh, good things happen on the journey as well as bad things. People are helpful as well as being difficult. One of the first climaxes of the book is when Christian reaches the cross. And so uh, Robert and Bev are going to read to us now. And Robert is going to read the passage from part one when Christian reaches the cross. And, and Bev is then going to read uh, Christiana of the cross in the second part. <laughs> At the cross. Now I saw in my dream that the highway at which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall. And that wall was called salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burden Christian run, but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back. He ran thus till he came at a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below, in the bottom, a sepulchre. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up with the cross, his burden loosed from off his shoulders and fell from off his back and began to tumble, and so continued to do, till it came to the mouth of the sepulchre, where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome, and said, with a merry heart, he hath given me rest by his sorrow, and life by his death. Then he stood still a while to look and wonder, for it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus ease him of his burden. He looked, therefore, and looked again, even till the springs that were in his head sent the waters down his cheeks. Now as he stood looking and weeping, behold, three shining ones came to him and saluted him with, Peace be unto thee. So the first said to him, Thy sins be forgiven thee. 
The second stripped him of his rags and clothed him with change of raiment. The third also set a mark on his forehead and gave him a roll with a seal upon it, which he bade him look on as he ran, and that he should give it in at the celestial gate. So they went their way. Then Christian gave three leaps for joy and went on singing. Braveheart and Christiana at the cross. Now as I saw in my dream that they went on, and great heart before them. So they went and came to the place where Christian's burden fell off his back and tumbled into the sepulchre. Here then they made a pause, and here also they blessed God. Now, said Christiana, though my heart was lightsome and joyous before, yet it is ten times more lightsome and joyous now, and I am persuaded by what I have felt, though I have felt but little as yet, that if the most burdened man in the world was here, and did see and believe as I do now do, it would make his heart merry and blithe. But it makes my heart bleed to think that Jesus should bleed for me. O oh, thou loving one, O oh, thy blessed one, thou deservest to have me, thou hast bought me. Thou deservest to have me all. Thou hast paid for me ten thousand times more than I am worth. No marvel that this made the water stand in my husband's eyes, and that it made him trudge so nimbly on. I am persuaded he wished me with him, but vile wretch that I was. I let him come all alone. You'll be pleased to hear that although we ended up on Christiana feeling guilty, uh, Christian himself feels very guilty a lot of the time. So it's fair. Uh, then, uh, then Christian, going on, has uh, another adventure, and I wanted to show you this because um, here's Christian. He's been fighting with this devil called Apollyon for hours and hardly shows a scratch on him, although in the book he's nearly killed. Uh, but this is such a gloriously technicolour devil that I thought you'd like to see him being vanquished by a Christian. And then he and his companion Faithful reach Vanity Fair. And we're going to have another reading which tells us what Vanity Fair was like. Then I saw in my dream that when Christian and Faithful were got out of the wilderness, they presently saw a town before them. And the name of that town is Vanity. And at the town there is a fair kept called Vanity Fair, wherein are sold all sorts of vanity, all the year long. Therefore at this fair are all such merchandise sold as houses, lands, trades, places, honours, preferments, titles, countries, kingdoms, lusts, pleasures and delights of all sorts, as whores, boards, wives, husbands, children, masters, 
servants, lives, blood, bodies, souls, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones, and what not. <laughs> And moreover, at this fair, there is at all times to be seen juggling cheats, games, plays, fools, apes, knaves and rogues, and that of every kind. <coughs> Here are to be seen too, and that for nothing, thefts, murders, adulteries, false swearers, and that of a blood-red colour. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I don't get the impression that Bunyan really liked feathers. <laughs> <laughs> he lived in Bedford, after all, where there was a, there was a, a well-known, very large fair. Um, and, and he was a Puritan, uh, and a Puritan of quite a Puritan kind. So, um, but Vanity Fair has a, has a, has a very um, sinister aspect as well, and Faithful, uh, after being tortured, is killed. And he is clearly a martyr for his beliefs. Christian goes on though, and Christian has another friend who will come across in a moment, hopefully. Eventually, they reach the delectable mountains on which there are shepherds. That's at the bottom of the third corridor if you're trying to follow on the map. And from there, you can see in the top, here are the shepherds with the sheep. There in the top is the celestial city. Not that far away, but in front of it is the river of death. Between the delectable mountains and there, there is some, the, the, everything, the going gets a bit better. Then. Uh, and in part two, we hear rather a delightful poem that, um, that Bunyan gives to a shepherd boy, which I was going to read. The Shepherd Boy's Song He that is down needs fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble, ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, little be it or much. And Lord, contentment still I crave, because thou savest much. Fullness to such a burden is that go on pilgrimage. Here little and hereafter bliss is best from age to age. And um, so Christiana's guide says, do you hear him? I dare to say that this boy lives a merrier life and wears more of that herb called heart's ease in his bosom than he that is clad in silk and velvet. So there's a strong moral tone to um, the whole, both of the books. We're just going to leave uh, Bunyan for a moment. Um, here's, here's the map, and I've kind of already told you where we are down here, looking up towards the heavenly city. And You'll be pleased to hear that we've, we've reached the last section of this talk. We're now on to endings. Now, where are the beginnings? Quite clear, aren't they? You know, you can say when something starts. It's not always clear when something is going to end. And so I've got rather a diverse selection of um, things to show you in this section. It's um, as though I was giving you a chance to select out of these various items something that might have some relevance to 
where you are, and I'll say at the end um, the extent to which they have relevance for me. But we're just going to finish uh, the, the pilgrims now, and uh, on your handouts at the back, you've got uh, Mr. Stanfast. Mr. Stanfast makes a great deal of crossing the river of death, but he makes a great deal for our benefit. Uh, he's in part two with Christiana. Christiana has already gone across. Uh, so that's for you to read at your leisure. What we're going to hear is Christian and his friend Hopeful. Um, after they've crossed the river of death, Christian, even at that point, is still very nervous and thinks that he won't make it, even though he's got this far. He thinks he's not worthy. And Hopeful says to him, oh, come on, look, there are people waiting for us. They've come out to meet us. Oh, they've come to meet you, not to meet me, says Christian. Hopeful says, no, come along, but I feel solid ground. And eventually Christian is persuaded he's going to make it through the river of death. And so he is. <coughs> Um, and so we've got them struggling our way across the river of death in this stained glass panel. And here another illustration by Blake. And here is the two of them coming up out of the water. And their uh, earthly clothes are taken away from them, ready to be equipped with heavenly ones. And here are two of the shining ones from the celestial city come to meet them, to take them up. And so, thank you, your last the last onerous piece of work now. Thank you. Entering the city. Now while Christian and Hopeful were thus drawing towards the gate of the city, behold, a company of the heavenly host came out to meet them, saying, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. They came out also at this time to meet them, several of the king's trumpeters, clothed in white and shining raiment, who with melodious noises and loud made even the heavens to echo with their sound. These trumpeters saluted Christian and his fellow with 10,000 welcomes from the world. And this they did with shouting and sound of trumpet. Now I saw in my dream that these two men went in at the gate, and lo, as they entered, they were transfigured, and they had raiment put on that shone like gold. There was also that met them with harps and crowns, and gave them to them. The harps to praise withal, and the crowns in token of honour. Then I heard in my dream that all the bells in the city rang again for joy, and that it was said unto them, Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. I also heard the men themselves, as they sang with a loud voice, saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Thank you both for um, that brilliant rendering of um, Words that are not that easy, they made it sound so simple, but they're not that easy. Thank you very much. Um, while we're on the river again, um, I, I just thought I would say that um, when I was at my selection conference, I was asked what I thought it was, what, what it was about to, to become a priest. And um, <coughs> The answer that I gave was not about the river of death, but it was about a river and it was about um, being someone who perhaps would be beside people who wanted to get across the river or deal with other obstacles in life. And 
and to be with them as they did that. It's quite a simple idea, it's not very profound, but um, that seems to me to be a way in which um, I hope that my ministry has developed, that, that idea of not being able to solve everybody's problems, but being there um, in, in sympathy and um, being with them is something that perhaps uh, I've certainly tried to do and I hope perhaps I've been successful sometimes. Um, but the other thing about about death is that it reminds us of funerals. I talked about uh, weddings and baptisms. But in a way, funerals are one of the most demanding things that a minister has to do. But also they're one of the most rewarding. I was amazed the first funeral that I did that I would go to a complete stranger and they would open their hearts about someone they'd known and loved who I'd never known. Um, and exposed all kinds of feelings which would never normally have come up. And that's happened time and time again. Sometimes I have known people, and that makes a, a funeral uh, a privilege and an honour as well. And so again, that's something about, about, um, about being a priest or a minister. Um, now, two further items. And the first of these is, is uh, slightly bizarre, but that comes into the category, perhaps, of foibles. I don't know whether you know Dungeness, uh, the bottom of Kent, at the end of Romney March. It's a very strange place, very strange place indeed, um, but you can't go any further. You just go into the sea, you get carried away by the current if you go to the sea. The other side, if you get, try to get to the sea, you've got acres of mud flats to get over at no time. But it's a very strange place. These huge banks of shingle, and the shingle is being added to. Dungeness is one part of England that's actually growing all the time. Um, and, and it's an odd mixture of, of desolation, and um, it's a, a boat graveyard, and a graveyard of industrial and semi-industrial and sheds and things. And, and it's a place of beauty. This is Derek Jarman's cottage with its lovely garden that has been bought for the nation uh, through crowdfunding, I think. Um, and here's the second of two lighthouses at, at the point, and there's a cafe, and there are lots of people. Every now and then you hear a toot toot as the Romney High and the Dimchurch Railway uh, crosses the shingle. Um, and over it all, there are towering not one, but two nuclear power stations. <laughs> it's, it's a most strange place, but it was the best place that I could think of which gives some, some idea of what World's End might be. It's, it's, I, I can't say any more than that, anyway, you don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we're having problems with the technology, I do want to know about the word about Hyde. That little piece of music we heard a uh, second was was, um, was something like him. Um, but I wanted to talk about the last years of his life. He retired from being a composer in employment for the whole of his life, hugely prolific. But more than that, he was such an attractive character. He loved his musicians. He read the Farewell Symphony to, to bring home to their employer the fact that they ought to be going to the other palace where their families were. Um, he was called Papa Haydn. Uh, he was just an engaging character, and his music is just the same. It's beautiful, and there is an awful lot of it. I've never heard a piece, I don't think, which, which I don't like. And I'm also going to play you something from The Creation, which he wrote in, uh, within the last few years of his life. Tremendous <coughs> oratory, which I'm not going to now. The words are, are up there, so if you know it, you'll have to imagine it. But there's another thing. He was hugely religious as well, and every piece of music that he wrote, he started with the nomine domini, in the name of the Lord. And when he got to the end, thou stay, praise God. So, uh, for me, he's as close to perfection as it's possible for anyone to get to. And um, the end is that he carried on writing almost to the end. He started a string quartet and he only managed to write two of the four uh, movements on it before he put down his pen for the last time. So, there you are, it's a little selection of endings, and I thought I would just say something about um, my own ending. 
here. And people keep asking me what I'm going to do, as though that all this time that's going to be stretching before me is, is time that I will have difficulty filling. <laughs> but I, I have retired from other things, and um, projects and things to do have always cropped up to fill the time almost exactly, and to keep me as busy as ever. I, I don't feel that I'm destined for idleness, <laughs> um, and I'm certainly not temperamentally suited to idleness. Um, but it is going to be difficult. I've, I've been, by keeping busy, the weeks before Easter are always busy, um, and this week has been busy too, and, and as I said earlier, I've got three sermons to write for Sunday. So. Until we get to Sunday, um, Sunday evening, I won't even be thinking about what the future is going to hold. But somewhere within it, I think there is going to be a satisfactory ending. I'd like to think that ultimately it would be a good death. But I know enough to know that things don't always work out like that. You don't have control over things always, do you? Uh, I, would, I would like to hope that. But um, I can't guarantee that I will be like Mr. Stanfast or like Christian or, or even Christian and, and, and hopeful and get through the river of death in the best possible way. Um, but uh, whatever I do, I will kind of hold in my heart um, everything that I have learned here, everyone that I have known and who to me really falls in that category of dearly beloved. It's the beginning of morning and evening prayer according to the Book of Common Prayer. And what a wonderful way to begin. There's no, nothing impersonal about it. It's embracing everyone who's in church that day and those beyond in those words. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness and that we should not cloak nor dissemble them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father. You see, it just rolls off the tongue, but dearly beloved are the key words. And it's just such a privilege for me to be able to stand and say that. I'm not a particularly demonstrative or emotional person, but when I say it, I mean it. It has meaning and relevance to me, and that's meaning and relevance that I shall take away with me. So it's all been privilege and honour and such great opportunity, such a wonderful place to have been in these last 20 years. That's it. <laughs>